think we have a really uh, outstanding program today, and as Neil had uh, told you, the real value in addition to the speakers that we have here today is the uh, value we get out of uh, videoing this and then the interviews, and then it's being able to be viewed all over the United States. <coughs> it's an exciting time in the beef industry, and I think the Charlet business is uh, clearly uh, moving forward, certainly with a lot of uh, potential for the commercial industry. U.S.-wide, uh, I don't think there's any secret, we've really uh, <coughs> changed this cow herd back towards a black color. Um, that uh, had been uh, a whole bunch of different colors before that, and, uh, and now we see the p potential uh, for a great opportunity for continental breed like Charlet to move forward. And uh, our first speaker today is a guy by the name of uh, Austin Paul. He's from Paris, Kentucky. Uh, he's a livestock dealer and an order buyer. He's a partner in the uh, Bluegrass Stockyards. He's a stocker operator and he'll, uh, he'll buy and sell and about uh, 4,000 head of cattle a year and most of those, my understanding, uh, he sends them through, uh, on through the feedlots and uh, so he gets a great bit of understanding. I asked him how many cows he had and he said, I have enough cows to run about 50 Charlet bulls. So uh, you do the math on that and you'll end up with several cows, I'll tell you that. So looking forward, Austin, to uh, your telling us. So the way we'll kind of do this today is um, after each speaker, we'll give a, an opportunity for a couple of questions. And I'm, uh, I think, getting good audience participation and questions uh, really adds value to a program. So, Let's give a warm, warm welcome to Austin. Austin, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. I guess, um, like you said, my name's Austin Paul. I'm a, I buy and sell cattle for a living. I'm a partner at Eugene Barber and Sons, a border buying firm. Me and the two Barber brothers um, operate together. Um, uh, I'm also a <coughs> shareholder in the Bluegrass Stockyards. We put that together about uh, the way it's currently operated about probably 20 years ago now. We have seven livestock markets that scattered through central Kentucky. Um, and we do some video sales and things of that nature. Um, I guess uh, on a personal level, I graze cattle on my home farm and um, primarily buy these calves one at a time out of the auctions, and bull calves and horns and stuff, try to make something out of them. <coughs> I send them all basically to feed. I, I, I don't sell any stalker cattle. I feel like that's a conflict of interest with the rest of my businesses that I have going on. Um, uh, I also have a cow herd both spring and fall. You know, I kind of, I shoot towards the fall cow, cows because the marketing time for the calves is a little better for me because um, the market in the spring seems like you get ahead of the summer, summer markets. You're, oftentimes ahead. Um, um, I also, it's a labor thing for me, you know, we're putting so busy putting in stalker cattle in the spring, we, that gives my people a chance to have something to do in the fall, I guess, you know, the calf cows. Um, let's see, uh, I guess when they, these guys, called me up and asked me to do this, they told me what they wanted me to talk about. And I thought, boy, you go to Virginia and try to sell Charlet, that's a trick. <laughs> <laughs> These guys were black when I was a kid before black was cool, you know. <laughs> they they, they uh, have never really changed much. Still, you know, we, we work some of these auctions over in this area and I'd say probably 90% of the cattle, or maybe even more than that, are, are actually Angus-based in this 
region. Um, I, I think that's because originally, um, you know, there's a lot of competition in the Eastern Corn Belt and uh, Pennsylvania and places like that for some of these, these Virginia or East Coast feeder cattle. Um, uh, those guys had a tendency to feed a little lower quality, higher roughage ration. It took a little longer to get them done. And just kind of, you know, they weren't quite as competitive as far as cattle feeders. Uh, actually, the Angus deal worked well for them. So, and then the Eastern Packers kind of, you know, developed their niches into that higher quality animal, the slower fed, high choice type animal. So, and, and anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say here is I don't think that you guys is trying to sell Charlotte Bulls can necessarily reinvent the wheel and get these guys in the East to totally change, but you can complement what they already got going on with these Charlotte Bulls. Do uh, you want to turn yeah. on the slides on? If someone will flip those two light switches right there, yeah, just drop the lights. I'm just going to show you some random pictures <laughs> of some of the stuff that I've just took off my phone this morning, actually. <laughs> you know, just to drive, or just have, have some pictures on my telephone, kind of. What I see is, uh, and this is all subject to arguments, so you, but this is kind of what I see as the, as the way you can complement these black cows or English type cows in the East with these Charlotte bulls. <coughs> You know, the number one thing that we sell in the industry is pounds. I mean, Brian's going to come up here in a minute and talk to us about, um, you know, he's probably got the most successful niche market in the country or, or value-added market, I should say. But for the most part, the cattle in the United States are sold either live or on a hot weight basis. Uh, the Angus or English cattle, for the most part, need a little help with that. You know, we, we can take a Charlotte bull and increase their weaning weights maybe 25 to 50 pounds. Um, it goes on to the stalker guy, he can pick up Oh, I don't know, two or three tenths a pound a day, maybe, in some instances. Um, going into the feed yard, you know, you can easily make these steer cattle way over, you know, in the 15s. And uh, a lot of these straight English breeds will, won't come within 100 pounds of that. You know? um, I think that that is the best way that you guys can uh, can sell your product, I guess, you know, just the old saying, pounds trump price. You know, naturally, some of the black-haired cattle are bringing a premium right now going into the eastern corn belt because of the packer concentration or lack thereof, I should say. Um, a packer buyer comes into uh, a guy in, in uh, say, even northern Illinois, there's two or three small packers that, that sell the specialty product, or regional packers, if you will. They'll sell a higher quality animal. And then the rest of the cattle, they basically got one guy. He comes into that yard and sees mixed colored cattle. He knows he's got them, you know, he's not going to try. So that's kind of the reason why the black cattle are bringing a little extra right now. But they're not bringing enough extra to offset what, they're, what you're losing in, in weight. Because at the end of the day, weight's what we're trying to sell. 
and uh, this is just some more random pictures that I took off my phone of kind of what I think is where you guys need to be, what you need to try to be doing. That's the, the, these Charlotte crosses, you know, the yield, when they're finished, uh, probably a, in the 64 to, I've had them yield as much as in the 66 range. Um, you know, they yield like a hog used to, you know, <laughs> you get these long fed, uh, calves. Um, I guess you lose some quality grade. Um, um, I'd say they average probably six, uh, sixty percent choice type thing, which is not going to break any records on the USPB grid. But at the same time, the um, you know, the, the Packers aren't discounting for it, I guess. They don't seem to, you know, most of these Packers killing these commodity cattle don't seem to really care. They pay you the same for these as they will, you know, and I'm, it, with the exception being these few little specialty deals around. So. Um, I guess the downside of it is, 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 uh, you know, you got to haul these cattle a little farther. You got to get into the western Corn Belt. You got to get past Des Moines, Iowa, basically, before you can you can get them marketed as fat cattle without having an issue. Um, let's see. I guess at the, at the end of the day, it all boils <coughs> down to weight winning. Um, if I can be a, and I'm just talking as a, as a pro, uh, producer and a cattle salesman or whatever, if you will, that's what I kind of do is sell these feeder cattle to people all over the country. It, um, the, you guys need to be really careful with the Charlet industry. You're the thing you got going for you is these big, thick, growthy, uh, tall, if you will, heavy muscle, heavy boned animals that they're putting on these medium frame black cattle or colored cattle, you know. Of, uh, I think that, you know, what I've noticed as I, you know, I buy a few bulls every year. What it's getting harder and harder for me to find the right kind of Charlay, or in my mind, the right kind. Now, that's exactly the opposite of what the show ring, I guess, is telling these guys. They all want to have a white Angus, and I don't think you want to, I don't think that does any good. You know, you got to kind of put that, and you know, that growth in them. Because at the end of the day, that's all you got to sell is a pound. So, but um, I guess I, I, I obviously like these, this kind of a cross and it does well for me. And um, we sell a lot of these type cattle to, to cattle feeders and backgrounders and things that know, you know, that appreciate the production side of the industry, I guess. That's about all I have to say. A anybody got any questions? Or run them at me. Question right here. Think no, Charlotte. You take it to market. They want to discount your bay out around here. Yeah, they do. They, they do, do everywhere. everywhere. You know, that's the trick to that Charlotte is you got to cross it with some. Mm -hmm. uh, straight Charlotte is is a pretty tough sell. So it needs to have that, you need to have that Charlet Angus or Charlet English cross, if you will. Another thing that these Charlet bulls will do, it's a good selling point when you guys are trying to sell them. A guy with kind of a, you know, just a halfway 
decent set of cows, he can really make his calves look like he's got some. You know, they'll almost upgrade the 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 cow. Whereas uh, you put a black bull on them and you kind of still got what you started with, you know. Um, I, I think that it's, but to answer your question, it's super important that they have some kind of cross to them. If you'll notice, most of these things are all got a black nose, you know. Or yeah, but if you got, if you're a purebred breeder, which if I've you're, got purebred cattle and commercial. If you're a purebred breeder. If you get something that's, you know, every bull calf I get, I don't keep for a bull. Because I'm not going to keep something that I personally wouldn't keep for a bull for my own use. That's the downside of being a purebred breeder, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to pick that, you know, you got to factor that into your life. <laughs> you know, I don't think you're ever going to get a premium for selling a white nose Charlay steer. Used to, a few years ago, they bring as much as anything else with it. Just yeah. Nose. I mean, uh, within the last 10 years, you could take it to the market and they bring just as much as an Angus, Angus Charlay cross or anything. But and I think in the last four or five years, all of a sudden, oh, they got a pink nose. We're gonna have to discount those. I, I mean, think I think maybe the, uh, the industry is a slow trickle down. You know, the the people in my position, a lot of them didn't really care. So they just passed it on to the next guy. It's only till till they kind of got they hit them with their pocketbook that they started to realize started to make that change. And a lot of that, the whole the whole cattle industry has really worked hard. You think of versus the 70s, how much better quality of product we're producing <clears throat> nationwide, all breeds, all everything. You know, uh, I remember when I was a kid, you know, sometimes the steak, be, my wife, or my wife, my mother at that time would have to beat them with a plate, you know, <laughs> to get them where they were fit to eat. And, and it's pretty tough to find a, a bad steak anymore. You go to town, whatever the breed is, you know. And then, like U.S. Premiums, Certified Angus, and those guys have really done a good job of of helping our whole industry. But we're, we're what, the industry has gotten kind of blindsided on that now, and they're forgetting about growth. They're forgetting about what what pays the bills, and that's pounds of cattle. Another question for Austin. What's the finish life weight of these cattle that you're selling? Well, like those, like those calves off the cow that steers away in the upper 14s and the heifers away in the upper 13s. <laughs> You take one of these pictures coming up here of a yearling that will kind of make way eight or nine, no way in the 15s when they're done. And he, go ahead, go ahead. I'd, I'd just like to add something to the to the marketability of the of the purebred Charlotte calves. You know, it, us as Charlotte breeders, probably when we're taking our calves that aren't good enough for us to keep to the yards, then they're really, sometimes they're not a really high desirable type calf. And, and sometimes they're singles. And a single calf's not gonna sell like a package of calves. Yeah. So that's, that's some of some of the price cuts that we get. If you take, you know, you're not taking your best. As a purebred breeder, you're not taking your best to the yard. You right. hope to sell them at home. So what you're taking to the yards are, are really your, your, your calls or your inferior type calves. So that's some of the, some of the price you know, problems that we run into is, is because we're not taking our best to the yards. We want to sell them at home. Yeah, so you cut them for a reason. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean and, I'm, and I know that. And I take a purebred white calf to the yard, you know, he's not one of my best ones. Yeah. So. And sometimes we take bulls. Yeah. Young bulls to the yard. Yeah. So where do you feed, uh, where do you feed in your cattle? Most uh, of them, I, I, because of the, because of the, uh, Charlay influence, I like uh, to send my cattle into the, the Western Corn Belt where they, they'll buy them on a hot basis. Um, uh, they'll out yield the average and I can, uh, or I feel like I can make some money by 
buy uh, selling them in like Nebraska and places <laughs> like that. You retain ownership all the way through? Uh huh. I do that just because, well, you kind of, I did it originally because I felt like it was a conflict of interest if I'm trying to call somebody up and sell them my own cattle, you know, kind of puts me in a spot. And I didn't like going there, so, but. Once you start, it's kind of like getting married. You can't really quit <laughs> without without oh, yeah. pretty tough consequences. Do you, have, you, do you have an interest in like the bluegrass stock yards? You, know, you all buy and sell lots of cattle. Yeah. Like somebody that's small like myself and probably many other ones in here have 30 to 100 head of cattle. Okay, and we're trying to market those bulls. Well, our local markets are really high demand for the, the black eyed of cattle. How can we convince people that are running those those commercial cows, those black out of cattle, to buy our bulls when they're selling those smoky calves at a discount, even though they're getting more pounds, and we can convince them and show them on paper the pounds will pay? Right. How do we switch them over to to where the our local feed yards will actually? want that product instead of just the, the black hide of animals because that's that's the main problem on on our area because of the eastern packers and uh, and freight you know is an issue no matter where you're at in the country but but right here in virginia the eastern packers are pretty much they've survived by uh, specializing in higher quality animals you know that's the only way they've kept the Tysons and the Cargills of the world from running over the top of them, and uh, you know it's going to be a it's a, it's kind of a tough sell right here locally. And the other reason is it's been so you know these guys were raising black-haired cattle when I was a kid when nobody wanted them. You know I used to buy blacks at a discount rather you know before we start all these certified Angus and US premiums and all this kind of stuff you know um, I think that it's I, I think that the only thing you got to sell them with is, is pounds they need to say at the end of the day my cattle brought four or five dollars a hundred less but look at how much more they weighed pay attention to any of the carcass traits on the bulls you buy. No. You know what? I can't I, I treat my bull buying like like uh, um, you know guys treat me when they're when they call me up and say I need a load of feeder cattle. I feel like that there's people that are smarter than that than I am. And I basically I use uh, Charlay field reps just say here I need I need to so many bulls and here's what I want and those guys go out and hell I might get them from ten different people you know I, I, I they'll they'll run around the truck and pick them up and but I do on my heifers I watch my EPDs a little bit for for birth weight. But I've found if you measure your heifers, you know, that's pretty much a non-issue also. You know, it's just kind of halfway pay attention to your bulls. But carcass traits, carcass trait EPDs mean nothing to me because nobody's paying me any ex extra to do it. Now, if I had a, yeah, if I had an interest in, U.S. Premium or something like that, you know, those guys all, that deal was started out as a bunch of shareholders, you know, everybody's got a share, and it's been super successful, and uh, those slots are pretty expensive now, you can't just run in there and, and join that club, and and some of the other clubs since then have been, have been dismal failures, so, so those guys, you know, it's it's at the end of the day, nobody pays me any extra. If they grade ninety percent choice, I don't get a one penny more than if they grade sixty percent choice. So why bother? Go for the weight. But 
isn't that what's making Angus superior to Charlotte? Is the carcass rate? I mean, that's what I'm hearing. Is, I mean, Charlotte is inferior to that group of cattle due to the carcass rate. And, and Angus genetically, and you guys that are college people can <laughs> just, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're more prone to marveling. Uh, you know, that's an inherited trait on them. But, you know, so is the Holstein. They'll, like I told some of them guys last night, I was 15 years old before I knew anybody eat beef cattle. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so I, I guess hey, Jim, you're, go ahead. You're selling your, you're selling your fat cattle then on, on a live basis on an account. I sell most of them on a flat uh, yield, on a hot carcass weight basis. Just, just for yield. You know, and, that, and that pays for itself big time with these Charlotte yeah, cross So cattle. tell me more about that. So it's your, when you say yield, you're talking about um, dressing percentage or yield rate? Yeah, dressing percentage. Nice. And so what are your... Um, what are your Charlotte cross the average on stress? I'd, I'd say on the low low end, they'll yield in this, for the most part, and some of these that I have inside in these different places, some of those cattle yield as high as 66, as low as 64 yeah. on some of these outside cattle in tough times. Plant average would be what? 63, three and a half. What kind of premiums do you get for the extra? Nothing. You just get paid by the weight. Well, it's all about weight. Another question for Austin. Yeah, Bluegrass has a great network of video sales. Are there any opportunities for feeder cattle, uh, knowing kind of the remote nature of video sales, kind of connecting to a little different market? Well, I think. Did the, you hear that question? The question is. Uh, about video sales and the opportunity uh, for some niche marketing and using video in remote locations. So, your. you know, the reason why we started the video sales <clears throat> is because some of the um, uh, people had cattle for sale that were just too far away from from our fixed facilities to uh, to be able to participate, but they liked what we were doing as far as markets. So. You know we're we're wide open. Anybody that has a basically pretty much need a potload of something, you know, anything that you have for sale, we'll we'll try to sell it for you. Let me rephrase my question: How much more do you think you make for that added yield over plain average? Well, it depends on the price, I guess. Um, I don't have my calculator with me, but the um, um, say these cattle yesterday and I never did hear what they actually brought last night uh, brought 173 times um, let's see say 60 let me start over take 1500 times 64 that gives you your pounds of me. Yeah. 0.64. That'll give you your pounds of That's cattle. Okay. That's 960. Okay, take that times. Um, let's see, one, 173. Take it times 1.73. Okay, that's what you're getting out of your animal, 1660. Okay, let's take a regular animal that yields 63. So take uh, 1450, this would be like an Angus, times 63. It's 913 times 1.73. Didn't we just do it by $1.73? Yeah. Or something like that. So that's 1580. So that in that particular so instance, it made eighty dollars. Eighty dollars. So you know that's that's kind of the way we do it. <coughs> Basically, on the same amount of feet. 
Yeah, pretty much, you know. <coughs> Even though he weighed more, he was more efficient getting there. Yeah, a lot of these Charlotte Cross cattle gain in the fours for us. You know, tough winters, it'll back them off just like anything else. But. You have a question, Brent. The there. common theme I've been getting from you is that weight trumps all in this scenario. So what, what? have you found that you cross Charlets with to produce the best weight? You can see one of those pictures there. They're, you know, my cows are basically, you know, I, I try to find something that I can winter efficiently. They're basically <coughs> medium framed, you know, a 1,300 pound mother cows, 13, 1,400 pounders. No specific yeah. breed? Just, I try to keep them black as I can so I can keep it, cr keep across. Keep that, keep from getting that white nose one. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Reds work sometimes too. Yeah, you know I got a scattering of reds, and you know every once in a while you just get one of them. You know.